So let me now introduce you the speakers. Uh, the first one is Tim Street. He has obtained his PhD from the University of Warwick in 2018. His first book, The Nuclear Politics of uh, Nuclear Disarmament, was published by Raoul Lagin in 2021. He is a board member of Nuclear Information Service, and he has been working on peace and disarmament issues since 2005. Um, then we have Geoffrey Chapman. He is a research, at King, a research associate at King's College, London, uh, and he is a part-time lecturer within uh, the War Studies Department. His, re his research focuses on British politics, uh, British nuclear security, in the aftermath of the UK 2021 integrated review. Uh, Emily is the president of Leeds Pugwash. She was selected to be a uh, part of the first cohort of mentees uh, for the Young Women in Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, a program funded by the EU and hosted by the International Affairs Institute and the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Non-Proliferation. She has a BA in International Relations and she's currently undertaking a, an MA in, polit in Political Communication. Alongside, the, alongside these commitments, Emily is a research assistant working in collaboration with the University of Leeds, Savannah, and the NHS. So now I'm giving the floor to Tim, um, and I'm looking forward to hearing your presentation. Great, thanks, Francesca, and thanks to Andrew, and good to be with you all. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to give an overview of the costs and risks involved in the UK nuclear weapons modernization program. So as Francesca said, I'm a board member at Nuclear Information Service. So uh, a lot of the data I'm going to refer to, which is fairly technical, but hopefully will still put together an interesting story for you. That is based on existing research. A lot of it's been done by David Cullen at NIS, but also Peter Burt, um, who works um, for Nuke Watch now. And also I've drawn on uh, Claire Mills's work for the House of Commons Library, which I, uh, so I'd point you to all those researchers' work um for the sources i'm going to turn this into a blog so i don't have slides but um eventually it'll become a blog so you have to see it online probably on the nuclear information service website and the sources i'm drawing on are mainly online already but i just thought it'd be useful to kind of put them all in one place in a nice little package for you so to kick off um NIS has estimated the total cost of replacing the uk's nuclear weapons system between 2019 and 2070 to be at least 172 billion pounds. Now that is a conservative estimate. Uh, other groups have uh, estimated it's higher and certainly with the uh, escalating costs I'm gonna to refer to, it's probably uh, the minimum base starting point. So that figure alone shows you how it's a huge national multi-decade endeavor uh, with all four elements of the system being replaced. This includes the submarines, uh, the missile, the warhead and the infrastructure. The 2015 Strategic Defence and Security Review described building four new nuclear armed submarines alone as, quote, equivalent in scale to Crossrail or High Speed 2. However, the UK government's Centre of Expertise for Major Projects has for several years warned that the nuclear enterprise is facing serious difficulties. So the Infrastructure and Projects Authority's last annual report states there had been no improvement in the status of the nuclear projects it reviewed in the previous year. So I'm going to discuss each of these elements of the SPECS program in turn, starting with submarines. <clears throat> so the former permanent, uh, former permanent secretary at the Ministry of Defence, John Thompson, was asked by MPs in 2015 which project troubled him the most, and he answered unambiguously the new nuclear submarines. He, he was uh, quoted as saying, the project is a monster. It keeps me awake at night because it is the single biggest future financial risk we face. So yeah, building four new submarines is the most expensive of the UK's nuclear weapons projects. Parliament initially voted to begin the process of, uh, process of building its replace, uh, the replacement for the current Vanguard class submarines in 2007, and then work on the uh, new submarine dreadnought uh, class of submarines began in March in 2007. So at that point, the first of the four new submarines uh, was supposed to come into service in a couple of years time from now in 2024 and the estimated total cost of the project was 15 to 20 billion. 
The programme then moved into its delivery phase in July 2016, following another parliamentary vote. Um, and as of this year, as of now, work is underway on construction of the first two of the four planned new submarines. Procurement of long lead items for the last two submarines has also commenced. The first submarine is now expected to come to service in the early 2030s rather than 2024 and will retire in the, and the class itself will begin retiring in the 2060s. At present, the estimated total cost of the project has gone up to 31 billion with a 10 billion pounds contingency. The Dreadnought class will be based on US submarine designs, so that efforts have been made to bring the two nations' replacement programs in line. For example, uh, the Dreadnought submarines will be powered by a new reactor design uh, known as the PWR3, which stands for Pressurized Water Reactor. So the PWR3 is based on the US uh, design and will run on a highly enriched uranium fuel. And the reactors will be built at Rolls-Royce's Rainsway factory in Derby. However, uh, Rolls-Royce uh, is struggling to upgrade these facilities uh, to build a new reactor. It's also important to appreciate the production of the UK's new nuclear weapons submarines is connected to production of the UK's hunter-killer submarines, which are known as astute. And all of the seven astute subs have faced the severe delays which are increasing and which contribute to the rising costs and risks of building Dreadnought. Uh, looking more widely, there's also the issue of how the nuclear weapons program depends on civil nuclear energy production um, and the costs attendant there, which I'm not going to touch on now. There are also several other issues which impact on the UK's ability to produce submarines. And so these include significantly extending the service life of the Vanguard, sub, uh, Vanguard class submarines, a fuel element breach issue in the previous uh, generation reactor design, dock capacity at Devonport and delays in the submarine dismantling project. So that's decommissioning um, out of service submarines. And there's about 21 awaiting disposal in um, Scotland and in Devonport. So together, these delays in production could jeopardise eventually the Royal Navy's ability to main constant nuclear submarine patrols known as continuous at sea deterrence. So let's move on to the missile. So the UK's nuclear warheads are delivered by Trident D5 missiles. And so these are US ballistic missiles, which the UK has access to a common pool of. So currently up to eight such missiles are deployed on each of the UK's Vanguard submarines. And the life extended version of the D5 missile came into service in 2017. There is scheduled to be a further life extension, which will last around 20 years, passing through concept design and deployment phases. A review of this successor missile is expected in a few years time in 2025, followed by ground testing and a first test flight in 2032 before early production begins. These new uh, D5 missiles, the next version of them will be uh, loaded probably onto uh, UK dreadnought submarines in the late 2030s. So that's several years after the new class of submarines comes into service. And the types of technologies that are immediately going to be investigated on this program include things like boost uh, control systems, guidance, radiation, hardened electronics, battery technologies, and cybersecurity frameworks. So going back to the co connections between the US and UK programs, the missile compartment of the UK's new dreadnought submarines will be identical with the US's new Columbia class submarines, and the UK has paid for a significant proportion of the compartment's development costs. So this was because it was expected the dreadnought submarines would come into service ahead of the Columbia class, though this now appears unlikely. Okay, let's go on to the warhead. So in February 2020, US officials revealed the existence of a UK replacement warhead program, which the UK government subsequently confirmed to Parliament. So the US leak led to accusations that the decision was taken without an official UK announcement or appropriate scrutiny. Uh, then about a year later, the government's integra integrated review included an announcement, which I'm sure you've all heard about, that the UK's warhead stockpile cap would increase from under 225 to 260. And they also announced it would no, uh, the government would no longer publish figures for the UK's operational stockpile deployed warhead or deployed missile numbers. So given these concerning and retrograde developments, Nuclear Information Services, Service is currently focusing on researching the UK's next generation warhead. 
So I'm now going to provide a few selected findings from this is most recent report on the topic currently being written by David Cullen, uh, which will be out quite soon over the next couple of months. So these are just a couple of uh, findings. Um, it's going to be a hist it's going to cover history of the warhead and then what's going on currently. So we've got to first note that the current warhead, which is known as Holbrook, um, that's um, being replaced or has been being replaced with an upgraded Mark IV A version, which is thought to have begun in 2016. So you've got the Holbrook warhead that's being shifted into Mark IV A, and Monitoring group Nukewatch believe that the first three Vanguard class submarines available for deployment have now been loaded with these Mark IV A warheads. So that upgrade, as with previous UK warheads, was based on the US design. And the Mark IV A warhead upgrade extends the life of the Holbrook warhead by around 30 years, meaning it will remain in service until the late 2030s or early 2040s. So it's also important to recognize that the Mark IV warhead, for a warhead was designed as a staging post on the way to a full replacement warhead. So you're moving from uh, Holbrook, Mark IV A, and then to the new one. So new components in the Mark IV A include the arming, fusing and firing system, the gas transfer system, and new high explosives. So the updated fuse allows more precision of the altitude of detonation and the accuracy of the weapon overall. And that makes it more effective against hardened targets such as bunkers. Um, the Mark IV A upgrade is also part of a wider project. This is where it's get a little bit complicated. Part of a wider com a project uh, called the Nuclear Warhead Capability Sustainment Program. So you've got Holbrook Mark IV A, then going to replacement. But also, the Mark IV A program is under this wider umbrella of supporting the UK's nuclear weapons infrastructure, called again the Nuclear Warhead Capab Capability Sustainment Program. You might not have heard of that because they, the government, like to not talk about it very much, not release information about it. And that program began in April 2008, and it's due to run until April 2025, and its total cost is about 20 billion pounds. So that again puts an infrastructure deemed necessary for the replacement warhead program, so the next generation. And that's again likely to be in close in design for the US's new W93 warhead. Um, check out, for example, Mark Urban's report for the BBC, uh, where he's been talking to UK and US officials about the politics of that, which is very interesting. And he did a piece for Newsnight, which is worth checking out too. So it's likely that a low yield capability will be available on the warhead, on the new warhead, that will have increased accuracy and also potentially have a significantly higher yield than the existing UK warhead. As usual, the UK government has refused to give information about the timeline of the project, or um, as usual, I should say, for nuclear weapons issues in particular, and they've been citing national security issues, and they've also not revealed details about its cost. However, based on previous timetables and estimates, it would seem um, that the replacement warhead is intended to come into service around the late 2030s or early 2040s, because it takes around 17 years um, to produce um, such warheads, such technologies. So regarding uh, cost, BBC have estimated it could be around £10 billion over the next 15 years. Um, again, that's based on conversations um, BBC journalists have had with uh, officials behind the scenes. So let's move on to the fourth part of the program, infrastructure. So almost all of the, UK, in the UK's infrastructure for deploying, developing and building nuclear weapons is being rebuilt or refurbished. However, the UK's atomic weapons establishment, known as AWE, seems to exist in a state of near constant crisis. In September 2020, AWE, previously operated as a government-owned, commercially operated enterprise, was brought back into public ownership owing to its poor performance record. Later that year, the chief nuclear inspector predicted that AWE order master would remain under enhanced regulatory attention until at least 2022 because of safety concerns. Most recently, labor disputes and the impact of COVID have caused further delays to production. Several of the infrastructure projects the UK is engaged in relate to techniques used in nuclear weapons development in place of live explosive testing. For example, in March 2021, the MOD approved funding to restart the troubled project Pegasus. Uh, Pegasus involves building a new enriched uranium manufacturing facility at Aldermaston. 
but that was paused over six years ago due to mismanagement delays and cost overruns. Uh, the original project budget for that was 634 million, which it's believed will now be exceeded. Then there's the story of Project Mensa, um, which is about constructing a new warhead assembly facility at AW Burfield. Um, that also was delayed by six years and forecast to cost over £1 billion more than its uh, original budget. There's also a new joint Anglo-French hydrodynamic research facility for warhead research under construction in France, and that's under the name Project Tutartes. So I'm just going to wrap this up with some concluding thoughts. So um, based on what I've said, it's quite clear the UK's nuclear weapons program is vastly over budget. It consumes a large and growing proportion of defence spending. It's facing severe delays. These delays raise serious questions about the UK's ability to actually produce this weapon system. Um, that includes from official sources. Um, these mounting pressures should be being thrown into sharp relief by developments elsewhere. So we all know about the treaty on the provision of nuclear weapons, which entered into force. The UK didn't participate in negotiations on the treaty and stated it won't sign or ratify it. We all know about the COVID-19 pandemic. We all know its devastating impact, but the UK is doubling down on military spending rather than prioritizing a green recovery or supporting a global peace dividend as recently proposed by leading scientists. We all know about the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty and the UK's commitments to reducing its nuclear weapons and reducing their role in security policies um, to move towards disarmament. Yet as the 2022 re uh, review conference approaches, the story the UK has to tell is one of rearmament. So clearly much greater public and parliamentary scrutiny of the UK's nuclear programme and wider militari militarisation is needed right now. Uh, this is vital if there's to be any chance of the UK prioritising arms control, non-proliferation and disarmament. Thanks. Thank you, team. Uh, I think now we have Geoffrey uh, with uh, a paper on uh, sub-strategic trident. The floor. Thank, you. Thank you very much. I'll just set up my screen. Excellent, you should be able to see that. Um, so thank you very much, Tim. Um, it's a really great introduction to what I want to talk about. So I will be talking about substrategic trident, which is an even more niche capability that uh, Britain's warheads may or may not have. We'll get into that. So just to introduce my research. So at the back of uh, RAF Pendant Air Museum, a now dated information board next to the Vulcan bomber announces how the RAF is, or perhaps was, pressing hard for a new standoff nuclear capability. Unlike in the early 1990s, Britain now has no dedicated theater nuclear system, settling instead for what is termed substrategic trident. Understanding the nature of this capability is important as it could help explain the UK's recent decision to increase its potential warhead stockpile and increase, operation, increase operational ambiguity as announced in the integrated review. Using recently declassified documents, I will show how the Trident system, which was previously argued to be unsuitable for substrategic role, was translated into becoming a viable competitor to rival the proposed tactical air service missile, or TASM. When these arguments were made, it was initially envisaged that a material change to the existing Trident system would not be necessary. However, I have uncovered archival documents that suggest physical modifications to Britain's existing warhead were subsequently made to deliver substrategic Trident. As will be argued, although references to the capability have diminished, a substrategic trident capability cannot be discounted and poses challenges to disambiguation, crisis stability, and disarmament efforts. The path to substrategic trident can be traced back to the impetus behind replacing WE-177, Britain's gravity nuclear bomb, which by 1991 was being described as ineffective and incredible. Given the WE-177's lack of standoff range, aged electronics, and concerns over its reliability, there had been calls to replace it since the early 1970s. However, Trident warhead production demanded all of AWE's capacity, so a new substrategic system could only be produced from the mid-90s onwards. Uh, with thoughts on the future, Cabinet uh, Committee on Nuclear Weapons issued uh, a report in 1987 calling for a new substrategic system which would become known as TASM. In all likelihood, a program for TASM in cooperation with either the Americans or the French 
would have been procured if it had not been for the impending collapse of the Soviet Union. For example, in 1990, the argument was that a distinct substrategic capability was a vital intermediate link between conventional and strategic nuclear forces. TASM would lessen the UK's nuclear reliance on a single system, also to cooperation with France and the US, and ensure uh, that AWE had a new development program to start work on after Trident warhead um, production had been completed. Trident was not in consideration for a substrategic role in 1990, with some supporters of TASM claiming that it was more important that a fourth vanguard sub, uh, it was more important than a fourth vanguard submarine and more relevant to deterring threats emanating from the third world. However, the changing international situation and high financial costs projected for TASM created the requirements for, uh, for deterrence to be reconceptualized. Although some form of substrategic capability was still argued to be necessary, a limited use of Trident was first seriously considered as a rival option to TASM between October 1991 and November 1991. The idea was vigorously debated within the Ministry of Defense. The consensus was that Trident, as it currently existed, could theoretically be used in a substrategic role. Unwanted warheads could be jettisoned mid-flight, and although yield could not be varied, on-ground effects could be altered by adjusting detonation height. The possibility of using Trident in such a way was acknowledged to have downsides. It risked inadvertent esc escalation, although not necessarily more so than any other form of nuclear use, heightened the consequences of technical failure for the Trident system, and potentially exposed the, uh, exposed the launching submarine to counterattack. These risks were juxt juxtaposed against the advantages that TASM would offer. But given TASM's high cost, um, the idea was um, uh, disputed, well, the, the um, benefits were disputed uh, by Treasury officials, and no immediately decisive outcome was reached in this debate. 1992 was marked by indecision as diplomats gauged the limited French and American interest in proceeding with the co-development of the TASM delivery systems. Concurrently, technical studies were conducted on Trident being used in a substrategic role. Although these studies remain classified, the ultimate outcome is revealed in a May 1993 cabinet document. Although a substrategic um, capability was deemed to remain vital, then Secretary of State for Defense Malcolm Rifkin concluded that there was a distinction between the need for the capability and the need for a separate system to embody it. Given the conclusion that TASM is not affordable and a new gravity bomb was too vulnerable, Rifkin endorsed Trident as being capable, albeit with some risk, of meeting the national substrategic as well as strategic requirement. This uh, view was endorsed and announced to Parliament in October 1993. This would have been the end of the story, uh, a change in declaratory policy that Trident could be used substrategically. However, there is compelling evidence indicating a material change between substrategic and strategic warheads used by the UK. Although technical details are largely absent from declassified files, one document from late 1993 discusses long-term costings for the substrategic Trident requirement. It highlights how 34.5 million pounds have been earmarked in 1992 for future development and flight testing for a new substrategic warhead. By December 1993, the document notes that an affirmative decision had been made to proceed with low yield warheads, but this had resulted in an overall projected saving of 1.5 million pounds rather than the 34.5 million pound long-term cost previously anticipated. While a fraction of this saving has emanated from a reduced requirement for purchasing highly enriched uranium, the vast majority of these savings were incurred by the uh, development budget being almost entirely eliminated. Given the lack of the development budget, the extraordinary lack of concern of the ab absence of live nuclear testing soon to be imposed by the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, and uh, later Defence Select Committee testimony reiterating that substrategic trident involved a quote, relatively simple alteration to the warhead, it is reasonable to conclude that substrategic Trident's low-yield low warhead uh, involved a primary-only configuration of the existing warhead. That is, only the fission primary portion of the standard Holbrook warhead is detonated, while the secondary fusion uh, component is disabled or otherwise modified to limit the overall yield. This approach was very strongly hinted at by Michael Quinlan in a 2006 International Affairs article. 
This is not to say that the British Trident Holbrook warhead is variable yield. The available evidence indicates that there is a physical difference between a substrategic and strategic warhead. Uh, a differing HEU requirement is notable as John Walker records a similar alteration being used to differentiate W177's uh, different variants. In addition, a document from 1994 discusses the time necessary to transport different reentry vehicles to an SSBN if it's going to be configured for a substrategic role. The potential for this setup is evidenced by the US announcement of their W76 2, an analogous low yield Trident warhead controversially announced in the 2018 nuclear posture review. This, uh, this may have been precedented 25 years earlier by the UK. Until 2006, the nature and features of Trident configured in a substrategic role were left vague in official documents. From 2006 to the present, opacity increased as even the term substrategic is no longer used. Removing this terminology may have been an attempt to de-emphasize the potential for nuclear war fighting for either doctrinal or domestic political reasons. Whatever the rhetoric, substrategic Triton can never truly disappear as a capability and remains a mirage of threat. Using a limited number of Trident missiles for a single primary only detonation is an inexpensive option compared to developing a dedicated system, relying on a reconfiguration of existing warheads with established reliability. Even if a substrategic Trident is no longer actively fielded, it is unlikely that an adversary could discount the possibility that it was. This context could help explain some of the UK's recent nuclear decisions in the integrated review. The review highlights renewed concerns over both nuclear war fighting and disruptive technologies. It announces an increase in the uh, warhead stockpile ceiling combined with ambiguity over the operational stockpile deployed uh, warhead or deployed, uh, deployed missile numbers. This would allow for greater flexibility in loadouts of Trident missiles, with some potentially being equipped to respond to substrategic contingencies, with the rest having more warheads to overcome missile defences. The distinction between the full British Holbrook warhead and its primary only substrategic modifications could help explain British interest and relative American apathy towards the new W93 warhead that Tim mentioned. If the flexibility uh, often associated with the W93 means a true variable yield capability, then Britain's future nuclear responses could be more adaptable as it appears that it's currently limited to either high or low yield warheads based upon physically distinct modifications. This capability would be less appealing to the US given its greater stocks of submarine launch warheads that already cover the gamut of yields. This has been a nuclear warhead heavy presentation, but in my opinion, hopefully explains some of the shifts in contemporary UK nuclear weapons policy. The ability for Whitehall to question uh, Trident's capability uh, uh, of providing some strategic and strategic role has enabled uh, the UK to become the only nuclear monad. This enabled quantitative reductions to the UK's arsenal, so this history could provide some hope for future arms control efforts. However, this must be offset by the nature of substrategic Trident and the Americans W76-2. They are an inexpensive modification that allows a previously strategic system to be repurposed into a substrategic role. Any sufficiently accurate, uh, accurate uh, delivery system paired with a thermonuclear weapon could be apt for such modification inherently blurring any distinction between tactical and strategic nuclear weapon systems. Due to the lower nuclear yields, um, primary only modifications to thermonuclear weapons could lower the nuclear thresholds in the event of a crisis by offering policymakers a more usable nuclear weapon. Conversely, and most dangerously, an adversary may struggle to distinguish between limited substrategic signaling and the initiation of a full strategic attack, given the same delivery systems would be in use. If a single Trident missile launches to detected, an adversary would have minutes to react to a potential contingencies. A single tri uh, Trident missile's payload could vary between nearly four megatons on the high end down to possibly five kilotons with a single substrategic tri uh, Trident warhead board. While communication and targeting could be used to mitigate these uncertainties and limit any counter response to an extent, the, re the reliability of these factors in a nuclear crisis is doubtful. Although these systems create a risk of rapid and inadvertent escalation, any hope of verifying their deployment uh, is going to be challenging given their near complete commonality with full strategic warheads. 
I believe more research needs to be conducted on this theme, and at a minimum, the P5 should discuss measures to reduce escalatory risks of repurposing strategic delivery systems for sub-strategic purposes as part of their ongoing risk reduction agenda. However, acquiring more clarity on this situation within the UK is going to be challenging. While the 2021 integrated review shifted the UK away from its previous promotion of nuclear transparency, this openness has never extended to substrategic trident. Basic questions over its ongoing existence, deployment, rationale and role are left unaddressed. W76-2 is openly acknowledged as a distinct program in the United States with its own budget, opening the issue to inquiry, particularly in light of increasing NATO-Russian tensions. No such mechanism exists in the UK. Conflation of warhead variants, increasing opacity, and assertion of Trident as a single system diminish the possibility of scrutiny. While I believe that archival documents can shine a light on this issue, I acknowledge, acknowledge this project is a work in progress and look forward to your suggestions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Geoffrey. And now we have Emily that is going to tell us, uh, talk us about US nuclear weapons and uh, popular culture. Thank you very much. So you can stop whenever you are ready. Hi, thanks. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, um, all speakers today as well. It's been really interesting so far. Um, so this research is specifically looking at Vigil, which was a recent BBC drama. It's part of my ongoing master's dissertation, but it's also part of a broader um, PhD proposal that I'm working on looking at popular culture on a much more um, larger scale. Um, so when popular culture is taken seriously as a site of power in world politics, the boundary of what counts as politics are rewritten. Importantly, the expansion of these bounds creates room for alternative ideas, identities and possibilities, redefining what knowledge and whose knowledge is prioritised or marginalised. Popular culture, therefore, shapes political identities and the narratives that sustain them. It has been taken seriously in international relations as a site of meaning making since the so-called aesthetic turn in the 1990s. This project continues this vibrant and growing turn by asking questions about security and power in reference to the social, cultural and political reproduction and representation of nuclear weapons and nuclear politics in BBC's vigil, taking seriously ideas and norms embedded in details of everyday life as trivial as watching TV. This project creates space to talk about how people interpret nuclear politics and make it meaningful to them. Vigil was released by the BBC last year and has since become the most viewed drama since 2018's Bodyguard, a show which also depicts national security issues. Vigil is set aboard a Trident Vanguard class nuclear powered ballistic missile submarine that they fictionally named Vigil. This presentation is going to deconstruct two important representations of nuclear politics in Vigil and discuss their implications. So I have to warn you, there will be spoilers alert. Um, the first idea I wanted to talk about is the idea of the deterrent. Um, nuclear deterrence, as many of you will know, refers to the ability to dissuade or prevent conventional or nuclear attack through the threat of nuclear retaliation. It works on the logic that the ability and willingness to use nuclear weapons will render the possessor an impossible target. Throughout Vigil, the nuclear submarine is referred to as the UK's deterrent, the nuclear deterrent, or the deterrent. Referring to the nuclear armed submarine as the deterrent is an example of nominalization. This means that the process has been transformed into a noun. Vigil's script uses deterrent as a noun when in reality, it is a theory and many argue a myth. Such nominalization leaves no room for doubting the ability of nuclear submarines to deter threat. Deterrence theory increasingly is being challenged and many postures are moving away from mad logics. Nonetheless, the nominalized language used in Vigil reproduces certainty around the idea of deterrence. Very few viewers are likely to stop and question such covert aspects of script Yet the normalization and depoliticization of this language by Vigil is likely to be internalized by viewers. So on the screen, you can see um, a quote from episode one, 
where we are given an outline of the logic of deterrence. The entire nuclear deterrent rests on just three things. The first, you must have viable weapons. And second, your enemy can't ever know if you'll use them, which is why we keep the letter of last resort in a safe, inside another safe on board this boat. The final thing is your enemy mustn't be able to stop you. So you stay hidden. What's interesting here is that this description relies upon the existence of a dis discursively constructed enemy, as well as the centrality of secrecy to nuclear weapons policy. In his book, Visual Global Politics, Van Veren argues that the ideas of invisibility are intertwined with cultures of secrecy and secrecy dis security discourses. Invisibility is most often imagined through the metaphor of a barrier that prevents sight. Van Veren demonstrates that something cannot be seen is either articulated as safe, meaning it needs to kept, be kept secret and concealed, or it's threatening and has to be revealed. Interestingly, nuclear submarines embody a paradox whereby one must simultaneously understand them as safe and needing to be kept secret in the hands of us and threatening and needing to be revealed in the hands of them. Therefore, understandings of enemies and secrecy are complex and they're interrelated. Vigil script plays on and reinforces these ideas, creating tension through the idea of a high stakes game of hide and seek. According to, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, next point. Um, so the next trope that I was gonna talk about um, in Vigil is the idea of the Russian. So according to Phil Pop, fiction depicts war in very simplistic ways. Often viewers are just given one perspective on a foreign policy issue. Many have previously demonstrated that the UK-US special relationship extends well beyond close allyship and into popular culture. Given this strong Anglophone relationship, it is no surprise that Vigil provides a perspective for viewers in line with US and UK perspectives. Many scholars have demonstrated a long history of Hollywood demonizing peoples, cultures, and ethnicities, entrenching highly negative views of US as various others. Such popular visualization is suppo strips supposed enemies of humanity and makes their killing not only possible, but desirable. BBC's Vigil reproduces the narrative of the Russian enemy through the big reveal of the bad guy of all cliches, a Russian spy. There is a notable trend in the presentation of spies in that if the agent is Western, they are the good guy who wins, whilst if the agent is Eastern, they are the bad guy and defeated. As well as the antagonist, in vigil, fictional anti-nuclear protesters and politicians are delegitimized as duped for Russia. Operating on versions of this discourse, it should come as no surprise that dramas that portray nuclear security rely on Cold War narratives. Since the Cold War, there is a common trope in fiction across all genres and subject matters that depict Russia and Russians as a principal threat to world peace. According to Dodds, the Soviet Union is invariably shown to be politically unpredictable. Sharp showed how the Soviet Union was textually and visually constructed as the other for American and international readerships. Today, this trope survives the end of the Cold War. Writing in the context of cybersecurity, Wardle comments how the Russians has become such a common synonym for threat that blaming the Russians is a common way of hiding or diminishing other threats many of which are far closer to home. This frame preserves the UK and vicariously the US as a nuclear victim and never a nuclear perpetrator. Simplifying the messy complexity of the real world, Vigil's viewers are given a simplistic narration of nuclear security and threat, one which reproduces existing ideas of us versus them. So I wanted to conclude by stressing that it is really important that political science and international relations take fictional drama seriously. These TV shows can influence public opinion by challenging or reinforcing narratives of official policies. They are also an important reflector and driver of political consciousness relating to particular issues. The future political possibilities and limits of nuclear politics is shaped by relations of power, knowledge and discourse that are accessible to us only when we take popular culture seriously. Um, so thank you. That's the end of my presentation. And there's just some really key readings on the screen if you were interested in anything I've talked about today. 
Thank you very much to all the speakers for their very interesting presentations on different uh, aspects of uh, UK nuclear politics. Uh, we have now uh, a decent chunk of time for uh, questions and answers from the audience. So I'm opening the floor to questions from the audience. Please type your questions into the chat box. Uh, with a queue at the beginning of your message, or uh, if you're not uh, tired and you're not lazy, just write question and I will read the, the question. Can I jump in with two questions for my fellow panelists while we're waiting? Yes, you can take advantage of your uh, position and ask questions. So a uh, question for Tim, I'm aware of the great work NIS does, but it's kind of a photograph from our presentations. Where now? How do we get more scrutiny for the British nuclear weapons program given the increasing opacity with which it's being organized? And I, I did my PhD on, on the history of AWE, but it seems less and less information is coming out even, even as it's being uh, well, not relationalized, but incorporated back into the government. Um, so interested on your thoughts. Uh, and Emily? As I already admitted, I have not seen visual, but I've heard some very uh, different takes on it, saying it was quite subversive in terms of the way it portrayed um, British nuclear deterrent, because British nuclear deterrent is quite reliant on, on um, um, military professionalism for its operation, but with murders on submarines, does that undermine um, the presentation of, of the way that British nuclear deterrent operates and is portrayed? Thank you. Do you want to go first, Emily? Yeah, absolutely. I can jump in. Um, yeah, so that's a really good point. Like, um, it's not all bad. And the kind of the point of my presentation is that these um, these kind of narratives that are kind of so embedded in nuclear language and discourse are present in vigil to the point where I think script writers themselves haven't really analyzed and deconstructed them. They just do call the submarine the deterrent. Um, and they just do present Russian as, as the threat. Um, but there are a lot of good things in Vigil. Um, for example, um, human error is a massive source of insecurity on board um, the submarine, which I think is really good with making viewers understand that these weapons are unstable and, and can be subject to mistakes and error and miscalculation. Um, there's a lot of um, complicated gender and racial um, casting and scripting um, decisions that were made in Vigil, some of them good, some of them um, more complicated. Um, for example, the um, head commander was a black man and um, the head detective is a woman. Um, but there are also a lot of kind of stereotypical tropes that are played on throughout the show. And um, so, yeah, overall, in answer to your question, I think um, it's definitely a really complicated thing um, and like for time I just picked two um, important ideas but basically I think there are deep um, discourses of nuclear narratives that are so internalized um, that the media reproduces them that our popular culture reproduces them and I kind of want people to stop and think what does this do to the average viewer? Most of us have never been involved in um, the production of nuclear weapons. Most of us have never experienced the effects of testing or use of nuclear weapons. So how is it that the everyday citizen learns what these weapons are? They're, as we've all spoke about, they're so secret, they're increasingly kept out of the news and parliamentary debate. So how do people know what this is? And so much of it comes through our popular culture consumption. Um, which audiences will then internalize. And part of my PhD proposal would be to talk to the audiences and kind of try and understand how they actually um, are receiving this information. Are they receiving it as presented to them or are they kind of challenging these discourses when they think about the show? Thanks. So we have some questions from the audience and I'm going to uh, read them. The first one is for Emily. Thanks for uh, the very interesting presentation. Studies in young people and their interest in weapons and security issues show nuclear weapons are often low on their priorities. Is pop culture the way to change it? Uh, to change is 
and are, uh, are there other ways to achieve these? Uh, then there is another question, but I don't know for whom exactly. So do you think that the next general election could have any even subtle influence on trident modernization? Uh, if you want to speak, uh, if you want to answer the questions, then I will. Can I jump? Can I jump in to answer Jeffrey's question? Maybe answer another question, and maybe I'll, I'll ask my fellow panelists' question. Is that okay, Francesca? Yes, absolutely. Great, thank you. So yeah, just to ask, answer what Jeffrey had to say. Yeah, um, uh, what I'd say is um, Emily talked about the paradox of secrecy and safety. I'd say there's also another paradox of, around the secrecy of the, as I talked about with the cost of these nuclear weapon submarines and their comparable scale to the Olympics, HS2, Crossrail, et cetera. Um, those civil um, works schemes, I suppose, they were like, you know, celebrated as national achievements. We seem to be less willing, or the MOD or the government seem less willing to trumpet the nuclear submarines modernization for whatever reason, partly I think because there is this secrecy that it's by definition military programs, uh, defense programs are always shrouded in secrecy and that's the nature of the British state. So there's a paradox there between, you know, this is their number one big project, as I mentioned, that's how they view it um, in the civil service that, you know, they're stressed about, but on, and it's costing billions and billions of pounds. But on the other hand, they need to keep it under wraps for like strategic um, security reasons. Um, so there's another paradox there, which I'd be interested to hear Emily's thoughts, and maybe she's thought about that too. But I think that going to, back to what Jeff, um, Jeffrey is saying, I think that opens up a space because I think the way I look at it is in terms of like you have public opinion and civil society views, which and that we can always you know double down our efforts to get information through FOI requests, through working with MPs and so on and so forth to raise awareness and get more scrutiny. And it is more difficult because of the nature of the current government, which is very, it's even more resistant to those kinds of inquiries. But I think when you have a system, which is, I'm trying not to over the pudding here by saying it's at near breaking point or it's in crisis, but when the costs are so great and it is so important, I think that opens up a schism or tension in the elite and their view on it. And I think when you get different views or different positions on such big projects and such big questions in the elites, that opens up a space for a debate and that you could lead to new conversations about, is this really what we want to do? But there is, um, so there's opportunities there for civil society maybe to have different conversations with parliamentarians and leak, uh, give them information, say, can we have a conversation on this and get more scrutiny? But going to the question of will the next general election change anything, I think we need to also think about it in terms of the time frames and the time scales. So previous governments have found when they come into power that a lot of the decisions are made and they're locked into these systems, they're long term technological systems that exist over decades. And general elections happen like once every three, four, maybe five years. So once people come into power, they can't really turn that ship around, turn the oil tank around. All the money's being spent. It's kind of a done deal. It's a fait accompli. So I think we have to rethink how our political structures and our democracy can actually exist alongside these mega systems. Tony Benn once said, like, nuclear weapons destroy democracy. They can't exist alongside democracy. They're their own kind of like state, if you want. So I think we just have to think about those issues in a slightly different way. But if I may, I know I've talked a lot, but yeah, the question I'd have for Jeffrey is um, with substrategic trident and or substrategic trident or um, lower yield options, perhaps, could he maybe talk about that in context of the current crisis uh, with Ukraine and Russia? Um, that would be good. And yeah, like I say, Emily, maybe talk about the other um, tensions I mentioned. Do you want to jump in, Jeffrey? Or... Yeah, no, sure. So uh, definitely not an expert on Russian nuclear doctrine, and it's very much how, how the two interact. So I, I will uh, defer to, um, you know, experts such as Michael Kaufman, and there's all sorts of debates whether escalate to de-escalate is, is any for part of, of uh, Russian nuclear doctrine. But uh, Michael Kaufman made a very good point about whether systems like W76-2, which would be analogous to a British uh, substrategic trident capability, whether they would serve a purpose in such a crisis by, if you have 
this capability, would it disincentivize uh, Russian nuclear use? Um, he makes an argument that it wouldn't necessarily because the purpose of a Russian limited nuclear use in a situation where there is a confrontation in Europe, for example, um, would be to limit nuclear escalation to higher levels. If there is a, mm, a capability that would match Russian nuclear use, but not escalate it beyond that, then that would actually give incentives to Russia to potentially use nuclear weapons at that level, believing that they could tr con could control nuclear escalation and therefore could make having a, a limited nuclear capability actually make the potential use of nuclear weapons by Russia more likely. It is an argument. Um, hopefully these will remain hypotheticals. Um, okay, I'll come in and answer the question about um, the potential for popular culture. Um, so I think it's a really good question, and especially I'm such an advocate um, for bringing young people into the, these issues. Um, so as part of my um, PhD proposal, I intend to kind of create two resources um, for when people are engaging with popular culture. One is to be distributed for creators of popular culture, whether they're video games, film, TV, um, and kind of just responsible guidelines outlining um, a few things that they maybe should have at the front of their minds when they create scripts and um, talking them through things like um, the deterrent and normalization, things like that. The other resource would be um, available for viewers and a way of engaging with popular culture that encourages um, scrutiny and questioning and challenging um, what is presented about nuclear weapons and how it relates to um, reality, um, which is something I also hope to gain more of an insight to by speaking to audiences. Um, but research has, has shown, like you say, that people um, are very disengaged with this issue, but it doesn't show that they don't care. Um, people feel pow powerless, especially young people, as studied by Benoit um, Palapida, um, sorry, I always butcher his name, <laughs> the French, but um, he, um, he found that young people really really care but they feel powerless um to act on these issues um anecdotally um i ran an event in leeds with pugwash last week and so many people were just asking like what do we do about this like you can just see the crisis in their face people really really care as soon as they learn but we're just not given the information and we're not given the language to talk about these issues like we still see so often that um anyone mentioning disarmament and questioning the logic of deterrence, they're instantly discredited and often delegitimized um, in security spaces. So I think there's a long way to go. And I think popular culture definitely has a role to play um, when we're thinking about the average citizen. But ultimately, um, it's a point that Tim made when he concluded, greater public and parliamentary scrutiny is, is what is necessary. Um, so, and sorry, I also have to admit that I was too busy taking notes to hear the tension that you wanted me to comment on, Tim. Sorry, um, if you could really quickly just say it, I might have some thoughts. Yeah, thanks. Um, it was just because you talked about there's a tension between safety and security. So um, I was also, the, the tension I was thinking about was the tension between, you know, Trident or the submarines are like invisible, right? They're underwater, but they also are so expensive. The government needs to um big them up and get public support for them so i was just wondering if that's something you've looked into and maybe how you thought that might play into the stories you're um looking at yeah definitely like what's so interesting about that i think is um how much of um public understanding of things like nuclear weapons and trident it rests on this idea that it gives us so much power and security and safety and it's almost synonymous with um, uh, British power. And I think a lot of that comes back to ideology of state and, and stuff. Um, but yeah, like you say, because um, the submarines are invisible, but also nuclear politics in general is invisible. We can't see these subatomic processes. Um, we can't see radiation. Like it's beyond human senses. We have to talk about it through metaphor, through abstraction and through popular culture. Um, so. I think so much of what is 
what convinces the public that the spending is okay is these narratives that I've spoke about that that Trident is integral to our security. Um, we have to keep ours hidden, but we have to expose theirs. And um, it's safe in our hands, but it's dangerous in their hands. And it all comes back to this um, kind of ridiculous notion. To sometimes is so much of um, the UK's white papers. They talk about threat and enemy, but they don't say where this threat's coming from or who this enemy is. It's all relies on public imagination and constructing fear um, that legitimizes these weapons as integral to security. I hope that answers people's questions. Thank you. Thank you to all the speakers. So I have uh, three questions from the audience, one uh, for each speaker. Um, we have still half an hour, so I strongly encourage uh, people in the audience that have questions for uh, our speaker to write them in the chat box. Uh, let me read uh, the questions that have been written so far. Uh, a question for team. Uh, thank you for the presentation. When the spiraling costs and poor management of Trident are laid out, it raises some serious questions about UK security policy. Considering the lack of return uh, the UK seems to be getting from its nuclear investments. Why do you believe uh, there remains a lack of debate regarding disarmament in UK politics across the political spectrum? There is also a question for Geoffrey. Um, you made a point about strategic and sub-strategic being blurred, uh, but did you come across an archival source source that define what exactly qualifies as sub-strategic. Uh, there are open source estimates that uh, for the W76-2. Do you perhaps have one for the potential yield of the UK sub-strategic warhead? Thank you and also for sharing uh, the results of your research. And the question for Emily. Many thanks for this amazing presentation. I feel like discussions surrounding nuclear weapons are still very much dominated by realism versus um, liberal institutionalisms, and that there are there is limited engagement with critical post-structuralist approaches. How do you think we can further bridge the gap between the academic and policy realms to show the relevance of these perspectives? And I have also a question uh, from me for Emily. Uh, I think that your presentation was very interesting and you have focused on uh, the UK. I was, I'm not very knowledgeable on the topic, so the question may be um, not very smart. Or, uh, but do you think that in other regions or in other countries, the way in which the popular culture is linked to uh, concepts related to nuclear policy works in a different way, or do you ex would you expect to find similar dynamics in the construction of the discourse? Thank you. So I think the first question was for uh, Tim, then Geoffrey, then Emily. Okay, I'll try and be brief. So I think the question was about, uh, given how awful the situation was with the costs and the spending and um, the lack of return for nuclear, why is disarmament not on the table? I think that it depends from whose perspective uh, there's no returns, I guess. For people in control of policy, for people building the systems, for people who believe that nuclear deterrence works, um, that it gives us access to the top table, that puts us on a par with the United States. Um, I think they, they're quite happy with the system as it is. Um, this feeds into like going back to like this idea of narratives and storytelling, which Emily's highlighted. I think that we have to look back at the history of um, why the UK has nuclear weapons, um, how it was seen as a way, uh, how seen as a way of, um, like I say, like protecting our position on the world stage. Um, on a par with the US, how we're locked into uh, US systems of technology and politics, and how uh, this is all presented as being um, what you need to do to survive in a dangerous and um, hostile world. Um, so there's lots of different domestic and international um, factors which 
both are hard to chip away at and provide an alternative. And when you do so, you're, you're framed like Jeremy Corbyn was or Michael Foote was as basically um, anti-British, like the Michael Foote's Labour manifesto in the 80s was seen or uh, framed as the longest suicide note in history because it was seen as um, antithetical to prevailing narratives of what the UK should be like. Um, so the question, the challenge is, how to construct a supportive constituency for uh, a pro disarmament position. And I think that that exists, but I think when you do that, you have to also come up with alternative ideas of our relationship with Russia, our relationship with NATO, our relationship with the US, um, domestic policy in terms of transitioning away from uh, military systems and towards um, a Green New Deal and to sustainable jobs, uh, which provide and, and keep uh, good jobs for local communities. And that is a challenge, but it's something we really have to deal with and an alternative world uh, role for the UK. But I think that's, like, these are ultimately the, the big challenges we have, you, ha you have to come to terms with. It can't, it's not just about the system itself, the technology, it's about these bigger questions of the UK's role in the world. Okay, so uh, I'll answer the question from Arthur. Uh, thank you for the question. Hope you're doing well. Um, so the point I was making about blurring was that uh, the, the commonality in parts between um, Trident configured for its strategic role and for its substrategic role. So that, that was the point I was making about blurring. But then there is also an additional blurring about what constitutes different capabilities, whether it's strategic, uh, theater, tactical or substrategic. Well, all of those categories are fundamentally rather arbitrary and doctrinal uh, and were defined at different points at different times. Uh, there are a legacy uh, at the end of the Cold War. You had a number of British systems. Obviously, you had uh, tribal warheads and they would be used in strategic contingencies. Then you had uh, WE-177, which was the theatre system, um, which would almost be the, uh, the kind of final warning before full nuclear exchange if it was being used. Then you also had tactical nuclear systems, and that was the, the Lance system, which was an American system, but in use by the, uh, the, uh, the British Army. Um, so there, there was this kind of escalation ladder, uh, and hence why you have these increments that, that could, uh, could um, increase up from. Um, but the Lance system goes away, W177 is retired, so there is a need for something that you can use, or a perceived need, something that you can use um, below a full strategic contingency and that's where the terminology of substrategic comes from so having a warhead that you can use theoretically in a substrategic contingency that's where the terminology comes from so it, it's not defined in terms of yield it's defined in terms of usage uh, but just to your point about yields as well w76-2 and substrategic trident configuration as far as i can tell are essentially the same it's just britain did it first but much less publicized um in terms of yields there i haven't found a document that gives a specific yield because those sort of technical details are, are generally withheld in archival files but because they're so similar those open source estimates for w76-2 are going to be very very similar so we we are talking about five kilotons um i think those are all of your questions so thank you very much um okay i'll jump in then um so in response to the question about um the dominance of realism and liberalism and how to kind of engage with more critical um perspectives like if we say post-structuralism to citizens even to press or politicians they're not going to know what we're talking about and they're not going to care. It's more about taking what's great about post-structuralism and making it relevant. So question what is normalized, because if it's presented as normal and natural, it's taken out of the realm of politics. It's just fact. It's no longer an opinion to be discussed. We have to show that these things are political and therefore need to be debated and scrutinized and we need democratic engagement otherwise how can we have these weapons so 
definitely it's about taking what's normal and showing that it's actually sustained by um, power relations that are really, really political um, and challenging these power relations, whether it's state's identity, masculinity that we know from so much literature to sustain the kind of power of nuclear weapons. And it's about making it relevant to people's everyday experiences. So if you ask the average person on the street, they're worried about their energy bills. They're not worried about nuclear weapons. Uh, we've got to show how these are interrelated to different intersections of everyday life and to different people's identities and why people need to care and why it doesn't have to be the only thing they care about. You can care about nuclear weapons and you can care about climate change. They're so interrelated. You can care about nuclear weapons and you can care about energy. It's so interrelated. Um, so I think it's about learning what's great from critical security studies and post structuralism and making it accessible um, to the general public to encourage debate. Um, and then the question about the cross-cultural relevance. Um, I haven't looked into any like non-English speaking popular culture. I don't have any language skills, but I do know anecdotally from my reading um, that Japanese popular culture is significantly different um, as you would expect having um, Hiroshima and Nagasaki um, nuclear weapons are very much presented as a metaphor for death um, in their popular culture. Whereas we see in our popular culture, the often kind of seen as a mechanism of life, um, the way that metaphors are used in uh, popular culture. Um, it's obviously no surprise that our popular culture is so intertwined with American um, kind of ideas about um, who's a threat. Um, and I don't know about nuclear specific popular culture, but popular culture in general, you really don't have to look far outside of uh, Western pop culture to see that Russians aren't presented as the bad guy um, to everyone and that that is an extremely um, UK US kind of uh, post Cold War narrative. Um, so I, I really want to know more about that question. I think it's really interesting, but um, that's all I kind of know at the minute. So we have some uh, more uh, questions for uh, Emily and for uh, Geoffrey. So the first question for Emily is, um, uh, I work as a scient uh, scientist for global responsibility and we use the broadcast of Vigil to direct viewers to our website via, uh, via social media. It was very successful, so campaigners can still make use of flowed media uh, presentations. Do you agree? And then there is another question for Amelie. Have you looked into science fiction de depiction of nuclear weapons, especially in popular show like Star Trek and Doctor Who? The question for Geoffrey is: Do you think that uh, do you think the substrategic trident concept could be utilized in negotiations over tactical nuclear weapons weapons with Russia? I hope the question even makes sense. Okay, shall I uh, try and answer that? Uh, no, uh, and the the reason it can't is because, uh, like we're trying to explain, is that substrategic trident is the trident warhead with the secondary that makes up the majority of the yield removed. So, to get rid of substrategic trident, you would be getting rid of all trident warheads because they are trident warheads with a component removed. It's, it's a, a reconfiguration of the warhead, but it is the same warhead, which is why if you were to try and get rid of them from an arms control perspective, you wouldn't be able to verify that treaty unless you get, got rid of all trident warheads, which is unlikely to happen, hence why you can't get rid of it. Um, it was very interesting going through the archival history of this because there was lots of uh, civil servants from the Ministry of Defence in the early 90s saying trident warhead can't be buried because it can't. But if you remove these components, you're suddenly making two distinct variations of the same warhead with variable yield, but they're so interchangeable that it leads to this slightly nightmarish situation from an arms control perspective where you can't disaggregate them. Hence why I was suggesting that the potential, this potential exists for all thermonuclear weapons as far as I know, I'm not a nuclear weapons engineer, so can't speak to it in detail, but 
every thermonuclear weapon has a primary. That primary can be used as a low yield nuclear device. You cannot get rid of low yield nuclear weapons while thermonuclear weapons exist. If you have a precision uh, delivery vehicle, the capability exists for every nuclear power to have tactical nuclear weapons. Sorry for that slightly bleak announcement, but there you go. Emily, do you want to jump in? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on the question um, about, again, kind of the potential pop culture, my answer is yes, simply. I think it definitely can be used to direct people um, toward these issues. Um, and I think it should, that's why um, that I'm hoping that an outcome of my PhD would be to um, kind of provide create, um, creative industries with a kind of resource for responsible engagement with nuclear weapons. And um, Vigil, I also think it, is, it isn't completely bad. It, it does rest on some of these, um, these principles, but like I've already said, it centralizes human error, um, which I think is really good for showing the threat of nuclear weapons. And um, people engage with popular culture and they engage with it for hours on end. If they engage with a news article, not many people even do. And if they do, it's not for hours on end. So I really do think popular culture is an extremely important resource. Um, and it's really important actually to stress um, that um, video games are by far the biggest popular culture consumed um, and also the most profitable. And people play these for days, <laughs> not hours. Um, but they rest on the same ideas. It's, it's the Russian bad guy. It's the use of weapons for security. And um, I really do think that there's a lot of potential for kind of changing these narratives through um, popular culture. Um, and then the question about sci-fi. Um, my actual research is looking at contemporary uh, popular culture. So I've only looked at things uh, released post 2015. Um, but um, I do know that kind of we see correlations in popular culture and the reality of nuclear weapons. A good example is when nuclear weapons testing went underground in the 60s, radiation became distinctively less invoked in popular culture. So when it was less visible above land, it became less visible in our popular culture and therefore in our kind of everyday lives. Um, what's kind of interesting is that as we've said ha nuclear politics is so invisible radiation is invisible subatomic processes are invisible um so it has to be invoked through kind of metaphor and through dramatizing um but the most key narrative i kind of think that is present in in these older sci-fi but also still today in popular culture is and it's a dangerous narrative it's the narrative that that nuclear weapons and subatomic power and radiation was kind of bestowed upon us by some outside force, whether you see that as God or science, it's kind of taken out of the realm of human responsibility. And it's seen as this immense power that we were kind of given and we have, um, and it's ours to possess. And I think that's really dangerous because it removes responsibility um, to, from the actual human invention of the bomb um, and makes it kind of become synonymous and it creates paradoxes of science and religion that are just kind of so dangerous to me. Um, uh, so yeah, that's all I have to say on that. I think we have another question for you. So no time for, for you to rest uh, from Robert. Uh, the question is about the vigil. Is vigil seal uh, said trident was a 15 minutes to fire, but it has been stood down at several days notice since 1994. Should BBC have been held to account and made to publish a, cor a correction? You can read the question in the chat. Okay, great. Um, I mean, my personal opinion is, I, I mean, it, it will generate debates of can any popular culture be held account for any political issue. Um, but my personal opinion is that you should fact check strips if you're basing it on a real life um, scenario. Like 
um, like how um, Vigil is supposed to be. Um, like it's obviously fiction, but they're very much um, presenting it in the real world here and now. So I do think that there's a responsibility to fact check um, what you're presenting. So that, yeah, is my opinion on that answer. Um, I think there's another question in the chat as well. Oh, wait, is it the same question twice? Yeah, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, same question twice. It's Derek. Vigil, sorry to jump in, but in Vigil, I think I seem to remember because I was paying attention at this time. One of the commanders or some of the naval officials start, they start talking about the warheads. And I think one of them says, oh, yeah, the warheads are being um, replaced, but there'll be a vote in parliament. And I was like, no, they won't. <laughs> So I think, yeah, some of the, there's a few mistakes. I think um, it's good that the, that the program exists and um, the BBC have done some other programs which are worth checking out. Um, their website also has some information on nuclear issues. But yeah, I think that, so for example, like, and there's a good program about the um, construction of um, Astute at Barrow, for example, it's worth checking out and some historical programs. But yeah, certainly, um, also look, worth looking at where they, who they relied on for the information because there, there's some interesting people like, um, yeah, uh, I'll leave it there, but uh, worth, worth thinking about where they got information from. So we have 10 minutes left. Uh, I am now asking the audience if uh, you have any questions for our speakers, this is the moment to uh, write them in the chat box because it's the final call before we uh, end this meeting. In the meanwhile, uh, let me remind you that there is going to be another workshop after uh, this one, and it, that workshop is going to look at strategic weapons, technologies, and export controls. And it's at 3.30, so there is going to be a break in between. So it seems that uh, we don't have any other questions for uh, our speakers. I think that you have done such an excellent uh, job at talking about different aspects of uh, UK nuclear politics. Some of them were extremely technical, but you make it easy for uh, the audience also and for me to understand the technical aspects and uh, to present them in a very interesting way. And Emily has been looking at popular culture, culture and uh, UK nuclear politics. And I think it's, uh, you know, there is so much to say. Um, and so thank you very much for uh, this introduction to UK nuclear politics for me, because I'm not an expert on that. So thanks also to the uh, people that have been attending these workshops uh, and uh, ask very, uh, challenging and interesting questions to our speakers. So if there is no other question from the audience, this is the final call. I think that we can conclude this meeting and um, I think we can uh, have a round of applause for our speakers, virtual applause. <laughs> uh, thank you very much for everything. Yes, thank you. And uh, see you later.